Thank you, praise team. Again, it is a joy uh, just to be worshiping with all of you. And um, it's uh, such an encouragement to have so many friends and family who've come to visit um, us today in order to support uh, you know, the people who got baptized. And uh, that really is a gift, uh, gift from the Lord. And the testimonies um, for everyone here um, is just a, a really powerful reminder that the gospel that we believe in, again, is not something that we just hold on to into our, in our heads. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 1 that the gospel is the power of God for salvation to those who believe. And we saw that power in the lives of our brothers and our sister Teresa who just shared about how the Lord saved them. And our desire is that if you don't know who Jesus Christ is, you don't know what he has done on the cross, don't know the power of his resurrection, our hope and our prayer, our desire is for you to know him. And so today, uh, we're going to be taking a break from our normal study in the book of 2 Samuel. And I want to teach from Luke chapter 7. So if you will, take your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 7. It's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. And I'm going to be preaching from verse 36 to verse 50. So let's read from verse 47 to verse 50 together. Verse 47 to verse 50. Please rise as we honor the reading of God's word. Luke chapter 7, verse 47 to 50. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Let's pray. Father, we are forgiven people. Lord, you know that we are not good. For there is no one good, not even one. There is no one righteous, not even one. Yet in your grace and your goodness, you sent your son Jesus to bear our transgressions, to take away our sins, and to bear your wrath, to be condemned in our place so that we might be justified. And Lord Jesus Christ, though you died upon that cross, you resurrected from the dead. And the power of the resurrection, you give us life. Or you renew us from within. You regenerate our souls, renew our minds. Lord, you make us a new creation. Thank you for loving us, though we did not deserve it. And Lord, we pray for this service. And for anybody who does not know you, that they too will come to know the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, looking into, uh, you know, this group, I'm not, obviously, I don't know uh, the background uh, from which you come. Uh, I'm sure there's some of you here who are atheists and some of you here who are agnostic. Uh, some of you may have grown up um, in a household that held to a different religion, maybe Buddhism or Mormonism. Or there may be some of you here who have grown up in the church but have become disillusioned with the hypocrisy of those who profess to follow the Lord Jesus Christ so that you have denied the faith, and learned to um, walk with the world. Others of you um, might be here seriously seeking and searching to know whether or not there's more to life than what is in front of you. Whatever your background might be, no, whatever your belief or your intentions, our hope, again, is that you would, at the very least, learn about who Jesus Christ is, since you're here. But our hope and our prayer is that you would come to know the power of forgiveness that is in Jesus Christ and the newness of life that is in his resurrection. And again, the passage that I'm going to be teaching from is Luke chapter 7. And the lesson that Jesus Christ teaches us is that those who are forgiven much love much. Those who are forgiven much 
love much. I hope this is a good reminder to all of our members, but also a, a powerful testimony to those of you who don't know the power of forgiveness that is in Jesus Christ. Let's begin our study in verse 36. Let's read from verse 36 to 39, Luke chapter 7, verse 36 to 39. It says, One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who was touching him, for she is a sinner. So the story opens up with a Pharisee. Pharisees were religious leaders who devoutly followed and obeyed the instructions of God as it has been revealed in the Holy Bible, specifically the Old Testament. And they followed the traditions that were derived from the laws in the Old Testament. So they followed not only the moral laws, which are more or less obvious, do not murder, do not steal, but they also followed the ceremonial laws that are found in the Bible, like observing the Sabbath, not working on the day of rest, giving 10% of what they earn, staying away from anything that would make them unclean. And what the Pharisees believed in is that if you follow the rules, if you obey the commandments of God, then you will be able to make it into heaven. You'll be able to enter into the presence of God through your good works, through your obedience. Now, although our culture may not be as rigid and stiff like the Pharisees, many of us are much more like the Pharisees than we might think. Now, if I were to ask you, if you were to go to heaven, after you die, if you're going to go to heaven, I think most people would say, yeah, you know, I think I would go to heaven. You know, if such a place existed, even though I don't believe in it, but if a place existed and I died, I think I would find my place there. And if, you ask, if I were to ask you why, you would most likely say something like, you know, because I, I was a good person. I tried to love the people around me. I, I, I tried to help when I can. I don't wish harm upon others. So though you might not live strictly by any external rules or written law, you live by your own personal code so that you live a moral life. But what you'll be surprised to find out in the Bible is that a good person cannot enter into heaven by his goodness. In fact, your goodness may be the very thing that keeps you from entering into heaven. It's a very different way of thinking. Very counterintuitive. And the Lord here in our passage teaches us why. In this story, this Pharisee, whose name is Simon, invited Jesus Christ over to his home to share a meal. And as they reclined at the table, a woman of the city came in. And it's a bit of a shock. We see, and behold, right, verse 37, and behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And so this woman just randomly comes into the house. Now, this, is, of course, is, is pretty strange to us. If I was hosting one of my friends, if I had Josh over to my house, some random stranger came in, I go, what are you, what are you doing here? And I'd call the cops, right? I'd freak out and, you know, dropkick him. You know, <laughs> you know i call the cops. This is not something that happens in our culture, in our society. But it wasn't abnormal during that time. In the first century, religious people usually left their homes open for the poor to come in. And so it wasn't a surprise to Simon and to the others that a woman made herself into the place. But what was shocking is who this woman was. She had a reputation for being a sinner. Now, we don't know exactly what this meant for her, but it was known. People knew of her life and her lifestyle, meaning that she was maybe a prostitute or an adulteress. And when she came before Jesus, she fell down on the floor and she began to cry. She began to cry and to wet his feet with her tears. And that word that is used for weeping is a very vivid term in the Greek language. It's used to describe actually rain showers. In James chapter 5, verse 18, it says, Then he prayed again and the heavens gave rain. The same word right there. So when she came before the Lord crying, it wasn't just a subtle tear falling down her cheek. The dam to her heart was broken. 
And tears poured forth incessantly. It just came forth from her. And she began to wet the feet of Jesus Christ with her tears. And then she began to wipe his feet with her hair. The hair of a woman is considered her glory. As it is, that's true in that, in that day and age, but it's also true in our culture. Women can, uh, women can spend hours getting their hair done, especially for a special occasions like a wedding day. We know a woman's hair can be braided, it can be colored, it can be interwoven with jewelry or laces. Her hair in many ways is like a crown. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 15 says, But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. And here this woman took her hair, something personal and precious to her, and began to wipe away the grime and the dirt off the feet of Jesus Christ. And as she wiped his feet with her tears and her hair, she kissed his feet and then anointed it with perfume. And that term, kiss, is, is an intense form of the verb for kiss in the Greek language. Um, for those of you guys who know the story of the prodigal son, um, it's the same word that is used to describe the father, father who longed for his prodigal boy. In Luke chapter 15, verse 20, it says, And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Same kiss. Same word right here. Embraced and kissed him. She didn't just kiss him casually as a form of greeting. She kissed his feet with deep affection, brokenness, and love. And she broke off the tip of the alabaster flask, a perfume, an ointment that she would have used for herself, something for which she saved up. She poured it out upon the Lord Jesus. She was a woman humbled by her sin, overcome by the graciousness of the king. She loved him so that she offered everything to him. She didn't just give him some towels and a basin of water to wipe his feet. She offered her hair, she offered her tears, she offered her kisses, her devotion. She offered her heart to him. It's a beautiful scene. But then when Simon saw what was happening, he was repulsed by the sight. You see, the reason why he invited Jesus into his home was because Jesus, this man, Jesus, had a growing reputation of being a man of God, a holy man, a rabbi, a teacher, even a prophet of God. But when he saw this disgusting scene... Any allurement of Jesus was dispelled, and he thought to himself, this man, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who was touching him, for she is a sinner. Remember, Simon was a man who followed the rules. He obeyed the commandments of God. And the Holy Scriptures clearly teach that a person must distance himself from anything that is ceremonially unclean lest he defile himself. In Leviticus chapter 22, verse 5 through 6, it says, Whoever touches a swarming thing by which he may be made unclean, or person from whom he may take uncleanness, whatever his uncleanness may be, the person who touches such a thing shall be unclean until the evening and shall not eat of the holy things unless he has bathed his body with water. If you touch an unclean thing, then you become an unclean. Then, uh, then you become an unclean person so that you cannot touch the holy things lest you wash yourself ceremonially. Now, what can be more unclean than a woman who has desecrated herself with sin? Especially if that sin was sexual in nature. A holy man was supposed to be set apart from the profane and set apart unto the sacred. He must distance himself from the impure, lest he himself become sullied. And here she was touching him. Right? And look at the touching him, present tense. Right? It's the ongoing act. She kept touching him. She kept clinging to him. She kept, she kept taking hold of him. She kept embracing him. It wasn't just a one-time thing. He was allowing this to happen over and over and over again. This was outrageous. This man was no man of God. If he had any sense of the holiness of Yahweh, he would not let such a scandalous scene take place. He was no prophet. He was no rabbi. Otherwise, he would know what was happening. But the Lord perceiving Simon's heart. Our God is good. He even sought to minister to him. And it says in verse 40, And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. 
And he answered, Say it, teacher. Verse 41. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. In order to teach Simon the heart of God, the Lord tells him a parable, a story of two debtors. One who owed 500 denarii and another who owed 50 denarii. A denarius was a day's wage, so the man who owed 500 denarii owed his lender of over, over, a half, uh, over a year and a half worth of work. And the one, the second who owed him 50 denarii owed uh, about two months worth of work. So you could do the calculation in your head how much they owed. Both were substantial, but the former was significantly more. Now, when they both could not pay the lender, in an extraordinary act of grace, the money lender canceled the debt of both. And Jesus asked Simon the question this, which of them will love him more? Which of them will love him more? And it says in verse 43, Simon answered, the one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he, has said, and he said to him, you have judged rightly. You have judged rightly. And then from there, the Lord masterfully took Simon's judgment and then redirected it back towards him. And he says in verse 44, then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Throughout Simon's interaction with Jesus, you notice that he is polite and respectful, right? He invites Jesus into his home to have a meal. He even calls him teacher. He, as you would expect, did what you were supposed to do. He was a Pharisee. He followed the rules. But the Lord rebuked and condemned him because what God required was not courtesy. What God required was faith. And so Jesus turned to the woman to show Simon where he fell short. He didn't give Jesus water to wash his feet as an act of hospitality, but she cried over his feet and washed his feet with her hair, laying aside her pride, what some might say, even her dignity. Simon didn't greet Jesus with a kiss of welcome, but she did, not, she did not stop embracing him and kissing his feet with deep affection. He didn't anoint his head with oil in the dry heat of the Middle East, but she anointed his feet with her precious ointment from the alabaster flask. She gave him everything. While Simon offered only the minimum of what was culturally expected, she served him, and he didn't. She loved him, and he didn't. She worshipped him, and he didn't. Because she believed she had a debt that she could not pay. A debt that was forgiven by Jesus Christ. He didn't believe he had any debt to begin with. And so the Lord says in verse 47, Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Here in verse 47, when Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. He's not saying that she's forgiven because she loved. That's not what he's saying there. Rather, the love is the evidence of her forgiveness. The net translation of this text says the following. The net translation, the NET. It says, therefore I tell you, her sins, which were many, are forgiven. Thus, she loved much. But the one who is forgiven little loves little. The net translation is much more clear. Her sins, which were many, are forgiven. Thus, she loved much. Where Simon fell short was that he didn't believe he had sins, at least sins serious enough to require forgiveness. His righteousness, that is his self-righteousness and his goodness, it prevented him from seeing how sinful he really was. It's for that reason he saw no need to see Jesus Christ for forgiveness, which was clear in the absence of his love. It's like an Olympic athlete, athlete who unknowingly has stage 3 cancer. 
His strength, his endurance, and his skill prevent him from even considering the possibility that he is sick with a terminal disease. And as a result, he has no reason to see the doctor. Many people are like Simon. On the outside, you might function at an incredibly high level of morality, operating by your own personal code of ethics and conduct, personally displaying a beautiful routine of goodness. But oftentimes, it is your moral strength and your ethical fortitude that blinds you from seeing that there is a spiritual rottenness on the inside. But I want to direct you to take this time to do some self-reflection. Though it might be subtle at first, just, just think about your own heart. It might be subtle, it might not be obvious at first. But if you are quiet and think about your life and what you've done in the past, you think about your heart and your mind, you begin to smell a stench of decay that rises up from your soul. Consider the times you've been irritable, right? Or when you were impatient. Consider the times when you indulged in pure thoughts, when you were envious and covetous of the accomplishment of others instead of being happy for them, you were jealous. When your heart was overtaken by frustration, maybe even by violent anger. It's easy to forget about these sins, to kind of just move on, to dismiss them, dismiss the smell of the rot with a wave of a hand. But again, if you're honest with yourself, the stench of that decay is undeniable. You see, this is what the Bible says about our hearts, despite how good we may be. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 3 says, You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Again, it says in verse 1, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. You were dead. And because we are spiritually dead, we sin against God. Dead works proceed from our soul. And because of the sins that we commit against God and the sins that we commit against our fellow man, there is a judgment that awaits us, a judgment of hell. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, it says, But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Now, I know at this point there will be some of you who are inclined to dismiss this part of the message because it is unpleasant. It is an unpleasant thing to hear that you are a sinner who deserves to be damned. You might dismiss this part, uh, zone out, because it just sounds like fear-mongering. But again, I want, again, a moment of introspection will lead you to admit that within your own heart, God has placed within you a moral compass, right? Every single one of you, God has put within your heart a moral compass to feel a sense of justice, a compass that has not only guided you in your personal life, but has given you direction to judge the actions of others. So that when you see a great evil, you demand righteousness. When you see a, a, a grievous wrong, you long for that wrong to be made right. See, this is nothing less than your soul resonating with the standard of righteousness that proceeds from the person and the nature of God. And so although the righteousness of God's judgment might seem fanciful, it might seem unreal, it is as real as the moral compass that guides your life. But the very standard of righteousness with, with which you use to measure and to judge the actions of men and condemn the sins of others, that standard will be used to judge you. And that judgment is hell. But the good news of the story, the gospel, is that Jesus Christ can save you from your sins. But to turn to Jesus and to believe that he can save you from your sins, you must first acknowledge that you are a sinner. In order to believe that Jesus Christ can save you from damnation, you must first believe that you are on the path towards damnation. See, what our Lord has done is that he has taken upon himself your sins. 
your lust and your fornication, your adulteries, your drunkenness, your intoxicated highs, your anger, your bitterness, your resentment, your pride, your arrogance, your envy and your greed, all the th things that you have done wrong, he has taken it upon himself. And then upon the cross, the damnation that you deserve to suffer in hell, he will suffer that on Calvary's tree. The wrath that should have been poured out upon you for all of eternity has been poured out upon him in, in, in a finite amount of time. Infinite punishment in a finite moment. For your crimes, he was judged. For your sins, he was sacrificed. For your shame, he was crucified. Jesus Christ willingly laid down his life to suffer the damnation that we deserve by bearing the sins that we have committed because of his love for you. To spare us from the judgment that we deserved. And three days later, he resurrected from the dead so that by the power of the resurrection, he might offer you new life. To heal your brokenness. To regenerate your heart. To raise your dead soul up from the grave so that after this life you might be able to live with him for all of eternity. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4 through 7, But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. In love, Jesus Christ gave up everything, even his own life, and resurrected from the dead so that you might be saved to have an eternal relationship with the living God. All you need to do is believe. That's it, believe. My brother Ethan shared about how he thought it was baptism or something he had to do in order to get saved. All you have to do is believe. That's it. And this is what the woman in Luke chapter 7 understood. She knew that she was broken. She was reminded of it by the people in town, by their condescending look. Right? She was reminded of her sinfulness, of her brokenness, by the accusations of her conscience. And the shame and the guilt pressed heavy against her soul. But what could she do? She owed 500 denarii, 5 million denarii. What can you do to pay off the debt of our sins? She was helpless. She knew she was helpless. She was weak. She knew she was weak. She was unable and she understood and knew that she was unable. But it was in that destitute state of inability that drove her to stop relying upon herself and to look to Jesus Christ because she knew that in Him there was grace. In Him was the forgiveness of the debt of sin in His blood. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 to 14, it says, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, for having forgiven us of all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. And so in humility and brokenness, she wept and wiped his feet with her hair. She kissed them and anointed them with ointment. Not because she was simply broken over her sins, but because she has received the love and the forgiveness of God. She worshipped God, trusting Him to save her, knowing that she could not save herself. And so Jesus said to Simon, Therefore I tell you, her sins, which were many, are forgiven. Thus she loved much. And turning to her, our Lord says, Your sins have been forgiven. And he says in verse 50, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Simon couldn't see his own sinfulness, even though he was sinful. His righteousness, his holiness blinded him from seeing the sins that needed forgiveness so that his goodness, instead of drawing him closer to God, ironically kept him further away. You see, you can't smell your rot when you drench yourself in perfume. You can't see the decay of your heart when you enrobe yourself with your own self-righteousness. You can't confess that you are a sinner desperately in need of God's grace when you think you're a good person. You cannot thank someone for forgiving you of debt when you have no debt to pay off. 
He who is forgiven little loves little. He who is not forgiven at all loves not at all. And the unforgiven will have to pay their debts in hell. Like Simon, I'm sure many of you here, you don't have a personal animosity against God or against Jesus. It's just not the forefront of your mind, I don't think. No, you lived a relatively good life, especially when compared to all the criminals out there. Um, and out of that kindness, you're here. You guys are here out of respect and love for the people who got baptized. And you not only show respect and love towards your friends and your family members, but even towards this religion of Christianity, you show your respect as you're even listening to the sermon. But my plea with you is that you would examine your own hearts to see that you are a sinner, that underneath all the good that you've done, all, underneath all your morality, there's a deep brokenness. It's not, simply, it's not enough to simply respect Jesus. You must fall down on your knees and worship him, believing that he died and resurrected for the forgiveness of your sins. I'm reminded of the words of C.S. Lewis who said the following. I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, that is Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. (laughs) That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he is a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with a patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. And those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sin? You must make your choice about who Jesus Christ is. For those of you who are like this woman, who lived a life of flagrant sin, I want to remind you that there's always forgiveness in Jesus. Some of you may have been hurt by the church so that you turned away from the Lord, disillusioned by the people who say that they love Jesus Christ. Others of you may have not heard about Jesus, but you've come here today for help and hope because you've come to understand firsthand the pain of sin whether it's from the guilt and the shame of the things that you have done or because you've been on the receiving end of someone else's sin. Some of you may simply be lost in the futility of life. You attain what the world has to offer only to find out that it's empty and hollow. And one way or another, you know that things aren't the way that it should be and that there's a brokenness in this world and even a brokenness in your soul. And to you, I want to remind you that no matter how far you might have strayed from God, no matter how grievously you may have sinned against Him, no matter how deep your wounds might be, no matter how heavy the shame and the guilt on your back, no matter how dark the pit of hopelessness, you are never beyond the reach of God's grace. The world might condescendingly label you as the sinner, but His love covers a multitude of sins. All you have to do is come before him in humility, acknowledging that you are a great sinner with a great debt, and then believing that his death and resurrection paid the debt of your sins. That belief will lead you to worshipful love. And to you, he says, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. I know I couldn't cover everything uh, today because of the time that we have, Um, and for our guests, you might have questions about Christianity, more questions about Christianity, about God, questions about the Bible, and uh, I do want to make myself available after service, so after service, um, in the fireside room over there, I'm going to make, I'm going to go over there, and I would invite you, if you have any questions about Christianity, anything about what I said today, come, come and ask your questions, I would love to meet you, we have dinner today, Okay. But you won't have to wait in line. Okay, we'll bring the dinner over to you. So that's a perk. And then, uh, 
And then for um, our, you know, if you're somebody who brought out a friend, you know, come along, come along with your friend. Uh, uh, bring out your buddies and, and let's talk. Let's talk about the Bible. Heaven and hell, beloved, is real. And our deepest desire is that you would receive the forgiveness of sins and to know the love of God. Jesus Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So if you have questions, let's get those questions answered. Okay. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for our time together to be in the Word and to study this beautiful story um, about the sinful woman and Simon the Pharisee. God, um, there is no sin that can keep us away from you. For your love, the power of the blood, and the power of the life of Christ can save even the most wretched sinner. And Lord, we know that in you there is forgiveness. You wash us to be clean. But God, you not only save those who are flagrantly and obviously sinners, but Lord, you extend grace even to the Pharisees. And for anyone here who is blinded by their own goodness and blinded by their own righteousness, Lord, would you open up their eyes to see that they too are sinners with a great debt that is owed to God. And I pray, Lord, in your mercy, you would turn them to Jesus Christ to know that he paid off that debt with his blood. Lord, would your blessings be upon us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.